and talk and talk and talk. Amen. <laughs> My self esteem will never recover. Yep. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for, for reminding me of that. Well, I know that there's one thing that y'all really like me to stand up here and talk to y'all about, right? It's about times when I was significantly younger than I am now and I do something stupid. So last week. Thank you, Jay. So today I'm going to tell you a story about a time when I was significantly younger and I did something stupid. Are you ready? Is everybody settled in? I'm good to go. So I think I was in the fifth grade when this, or maybe it was the summer before fifth grade when this happened, um, something like that. I was about 11 years old, and I went with my parents and my brother out to Wyoming to visit some extended family on my dad's side. Now, they lived in a different kind of way out in Wyoming than I was used to living at the time. There's a lot of open expanse, kind of dotted, dotted with mountains. The mountains kind of come out of the plain, and they basically go straight up. So it's very uneven, kind of jagged ground, and there's not a whole lot of people. It's kind of spread out, wide open place. One night while we were there, my uncles and my dad all decided that we should spend the night in a teepee that they had that we would camp out outside and we would tell ghost stories and when the time was right, we would all, you know, call it a night. We'd all go to bed. So we built a big fire and, you know, we spent our time out in the teepee, huddled together, doing what people do out in front of a campfire. And before too much longer, people started to fall asleep. And at one point, by the end, it was just me and my cousin who were there. We were the only ones awake. She was stirring the fire with a hot poker, just trying to make certain that the ashes had all kind of spread out evenly, that the heat could continue, but that it wouldn't get concentrated in one place, that it would kind of move out evenly around the fire. And then she noticed that the part of the fire that was closer to me needed a little bit of attention. So she stuck the poker out and prepared to hand it to me. You see where this is going. Yeah. That is accurate, yeah. So, you know, at this, this juncture in my life, if, and if this is not still true, at this juncture in my life, it was definitely true. I was uh, very much a city boy. And I was a city boy who liked to spend most of his Saturdays reading books about history and airplanes rather than going out on big, great adventures in the great outdoors. Which means that I did not know that when you put metal into a fire and you leave it there for a while, you probably don't want to touch the metal with your bare skin. I know that now. I wonder how I figured that out. It was pretty much inevitable that I stick my hand out, I reach for the poker, I grab the poker, I pull my hand back, I cover my mouth, I'm trying to be a nice guy, I was ready to be a pastor already, to avoid waking everyone else up because I was in so much pain. And I spent the rest of the night sitting there in pain and surprise because my uncles wouldn't wake up and I didn't want to inconvenience anyone. So I learned that lesson pretty quickly pretty emphatically. I spent the rest of our trip out to Wyoming. Everyone else is having a great old time with adventures and such. And I basically have to walk around. And I can only do things with my left hand for the next few days because my right hand, I have an ice pack in because my hand is covered in blisters. That was my introduction to campfires. And I'm going to tell you all what I learned that day. You never, ever, ever Grab the hot poker. Amen. Today we're taking a bit of a pause from the direction we've been going on these last few weeks, aren't we? 
Y'all might have noticed over the last few weeks that we've been, the scriptures we've been reading have all been focused on Jesus' early life, his early career, the beginnings of his ministry, him beginning to set out to do his thing, to fulfill his earthly mission. Today we take a pause and we move a few years down the line, a few years down the line into the Christian story. Today we read something from somewhere between 55 and 65 A.D., so about 20 to 30 years after Jesus had lived and died and risen. And at this time in the world, at this time in world history, there were a bunch of small, secret Christian communities called churches that had just started to pop up around the Mediterranean, just starting to emerge. This Christian movement is now bigger than the 12 people that it was with Jesus, but it's still really small. It's so small, in fact, that a lot of these churches are being influenced much more by personal relationships than they are with big institutions. One man who wielded a great deal of influence in this world was a gentleman named Paul. You may have heard of him. He's the author of our text for today. Paul, though, was hardly the only Christian teacher in this world. Many of Jesus' original disciples were still active and still working, and new figures were beginning to emerge to wield influence and lead Christianity into a new era. A new generation of leaders and teachers was starting to emerge. One such teacher was a man named Apollos. He was an Egyptian. He was a man known for his oratorical skills, for his skills as a preacher. He didn't have to rely on stories about campfires to make his point, I would imagine. But he was good, and he was known to be good. He was recognized for being good. Perhaps it was these skills that helped produce a conflict in a church, in a city, in Corinth, between people who decided to follow Paul and people who decided to follow Apollos. Corinth was an interesting place to be in the ancient world. The city of Corinth that Paul knew had been established by the Romans as a colony for retired soldiers and freed slaves to live in, which means that when the first people who came there came there, there was nobody else there. It was wide open, a land of opportunity, if you will. It gradually attracted immigrants from all over the Roman world as people hungry for economic opportunity moved across the Mediterranean to pursue the Corinthian dream. Within the Roman Empire, Corinth became a place to start fresh, a place in which ambitious and motivated and driven people could pull themselves up by their bootstraps and prosper in ways that their fathers and grandfathers had never experienced before. Are you catching the parallel yet? Corinth, in a lot of ways, represented and embodied the same story that we tell as Americans about ourselves, about our history. And like us, the people of Corinth struggled with inequality, controversy, and arrogance. Today we see, as we read Paul's words, that Paul has a strong group of devoted followers within the church, but so does Apollos. We know about religious factionalism. We know about religious debates. We know about churches divided. We've seen these things on the news. We've read about them. We've heard about them. We've seen them out in the world we live in today. We also know about the rich competing against the poor. We know about people with gifts competing to appear the most gifted and the most talented in all the world, the most wise. We know about these things because we've seen them, because competition and hunger for more and selfishness are features of our life today in this country, and they were features of life in Corinth. 
a place where selfish ambition was allowed to run wild, even and especially in churches. If you were Paul, how would you respond to a situation like that? How would you handle it? Paul continues to teach the people of Corinth. But as he writes to prideful and competitive people, Paul refuses to make his teachings about himself. He knows, he understands, that he has his own vision for how the church, how the community of believers, the community of the people of God should function. But he also wants his readers, wants the Corinthians to know that this isn't about his preferences. This vision is not grounded in his preferences. And when you go outside of it, it's not him you're disappointing, him you're being disloyal to. Paul is a mere servant, a mere apostle, a mere disciple. And you know what? I'll be honest. You can read this passage and think that this is a man full of false humility. You can think that. But if it is, Paul has also deliberately exposed himself to us criticizing him on these grounds. Not everything that Paul writes in Scripture is without need of explanation, without need of exploration. But if you read today's passage, you can't help but think that Paul knows this, that Paul understands that he's human, that he knows he is fit to be a gardener, but he has not created the seed himself. This is not his garden, even though he tends it. Paul, I would think, remembers where he started, remembers that he began his career in ministry not as a disciple, not as an apostle, not as a church planter. He began as a Pharisee. He began as a violent and narrow-minded man who, by the time we meet him today, is living out his own version of the Corinthian dream, not to pursue his own selfish ambitions, but by being faithful to the second chance that God gave him. Paul knows that he was going in one direction and that his life pivoted immediately and quickly around a moment of pain in which God intervened and forced him to confront the person that he had become. And he knows something that the church in Corinth has never understood, has never figured out. That you can believe with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul that you are being faithful to the God of Scripture and be shockingly, frighteningly, horrifically wrong. And so today... Paul speaks of unity. But he doesn't speak of unity in and around the cult of Paul. He speaks of unity in and around the love of Christ. Paul understands that like a hot poker, we have to be very, very careful about how we handle our faith. As we cling to God, Paul shows us that we would be wise to remember to be careful and to remember how dangerous it is to grasp metal pulled from the fire. To borrow a phrase, we are not meant to stand on Christ's shoulders 
and call ourselves tall. We are meant to rest in Christ's arms and call ourselves saved. The church, Paul and Apollos, have both helped to plant and nurture the church and Corinth does not belong to either of them, and neither does it belong to the people in Corinth. The church begins and ends with God, and our lives begin and end with Christ. Alpha and Omega, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace. As we turn our eyes towards Lent, as we think about the weeks ahead, it's worth our while to consider what Paul is really showing us here because his message seems harsh. It seems that way, but it's really life-giving. As the people of Corinth squabble over their dreams, climbing over each other, trying to find their place in the sun, Paul can see that a greater game is afoot, that there is power in the name of Jesus Christ, and that this power does go beyond our human squabbles and our human factionalism. You don't grasp the business end of a hot poker, do you? But you also know that when you have the hot poker, you don't have to manage the fires of life alone. And yes, our Corinthian dreams might seem to be great, but if we venture out into our own expectations, out of our own expectations, and into real life with Jesus, Paul knows what we will find. A second chance, a new hope, a new world to live in, joy unlike anything that we have ever known before. Amen.